The spacious upper hall was completely trashed, with holes in the floorboards, tables knocked over, plant pots smashed, more damaged paintings, damaged walls, and holes in the dusty ceiling. The atmosphere was eerie as it was downstairs and outside. There were various doors leading into the guest lodgings and the morning room on the side further away from the stairs, while the workers' lodgings were where the couple were currently standing. There was a large window on the wall in the middle, suggesting the large amount of space was above where the arch was. Nigel and Hannah continued their cautious journey towards the window in the middle of the hall, while narrowly avoiding stepping through the holes in the floorboards. As they looked out, Hannah observed how unusually quiet it was, and Nigel agreed, with not even the sound of wind or a bird chirping to be heard. Do you hear that stupid horse? asked Hannah. Nigel kept his ears alert. Sure enough, they both heard the faint sound of the horse blowing a raspberry. Trying to forget about the unpleasant beast, they continued towards the other side of the building, where the guest lodgings and the morning room were. Nigel approached the morning room door and attempted to open it. It was unlocked, so he slowly went inside with Hannah, who was still following him closely behind. What was perhaps once a nice, quiet, relaxing area for drinking tea and having breakfast was now a decrepit, dirty, messy room with flipped over tables, several weak or broken chairs, a broken table, broken windows, a torn up chaise lounge, an old fireplace with a broken mantle, damaged paintings hanging on the walls, and a single undamaged painting of the green horse. There was a lounge chair with a sheet wrapped over it and a couple of armchairs, one of which was heavily torn up and damaged. Two candles in old-fashioned brass candle carriers covered in dust and frail cobwebs populated the mantle, with the spiders who created the webs long gone. Careful not to enter just yet, Nigel shined the light throughout the room, with he and Hannah watching intently to see if they could spot anything in the darkness. After a moment of silently looking around, the cloaked female dashed out from hiding behind one of the flipped over tables to taking cover behind the lounge chair covered in a sheet. Yelling out to the figure, Nigel dashed into the room. Hannah, ready to use her weapon, followed behind with some distance as the two of them went to rush the figure from both sides. There was a small but fast-paced struggle, with the figure childishly fighting them off with flailing arms and kicking legs. The figure was a lot smaller and weaker than anticipated, however. Nigel managed to get the upper hand and force the figure up into the air by the back of their collar. Hannah took a few steps back and pointed the knife at the figure with a shaky arm. Nigel handed Hannah the flashlight and yanked the person's hood back, revealing them to be little more than a child. The girl was a timid, quiet and quivering girl no older than eleven, with straw blonde hair, pale skin and dark hazel green eyes, just as Hannah had vaguely made out earlier. She was wearing countryside-friendly black boots, her cloak was dark grey, and she was wearing a surprisingly clean, pretty white dress with a green tint to it, as well as green patterns sewed into her dress's sleeve cuffs, collar, and waist. She's a... child, said Nigel in bemusement as he put the girl down. Oh my god, said Hannah in shock. What are you doing here? I'm sorry, said the girl. I didn't mean to scare you. I didn't know how to ask for help. I'm sorry, I... I just got scared. The girl instantly became shy and picked up something she dropped in the struggle. A teddy bear with a button eye, a bit of string where the other eye used to be, and a sewed mouth with a hole in it. She began cuddling it to calm herself down. Nigel and Hannah looked at one another, feeling incredibly bad at having attacked a child in an abandoned rotting inn. Hannah only then just remembered she still had a knife out and quickly proceeded to pocket it. Nigel knelt down to the girl's level and began to question why she was there. My family and I were staying at the inn, said the girl. Your parents? asked Nigel. And my grandmother, she replied with a nod. We got stranded on the road nearby and found this place. Nigel asked the girl where her parents were now. This seemed to touch a nerve as the girl's eyes began to tear up. She began to sob quietly, tightly clutching her teddy to her chest and pressing her cheek against it. Hannah comforted the girl by kneeling down and rubbing her back gently in a clockwise fashion. Nigel quickly moved around the chair and took the sheet off. Hannah guided the girl to sit in the chair and crouch down to be at her level while Nigel stayed standing, holding the flashlight in a position so the three of them could see. Um... 
Nigel awkwardly knelt down, preparing to make a second attempt at talking to the girl. I... I'm Nigel. This is my partner, Hannah. What's your name? Hmm. Meredith, said the girl. Oh, that's a pretty name, said Hannah. Thanks, said Meredith. I don't think we should be here, said Nigel. You definitely shouldn't. We have a car out by the road. You saw it when you ran past, right? Meredith nodded. You must know your way in and out of these woods, surely. You... Well, you've left this place. For whatever reason, we can't seem to leave. You could lead us out, right? M maybe. I... I've... I, I've... It feels like I've been here for so long, so I struggle to leave. It's so dark and cold and scary out there. Every time I try to leave, I just keep coming back because I can't find my way home. I know, my dear, but... Well, we might not be friends just yet, but we know each other's names. That's a start. You know we mean you no harm, and we're pretty sure you can't hurt us. And I'm sure you don't want to either, right? Said Hannah. Meredith looked up at Hannah, who gave the girl a warm smile. The corner of Meredith's mouth twitched a little smile as she seemingly understood the humour in their remarks. But she gave nothing more and eventually looked back down at the ground, out of childlike shyness. Warning Meredith that the already faulty light wouldn't last forever, Nigel stood back up and shined the light over at the fire mantle, illuminating the candle carriers. He walked over to the mantle and took out his lighter, using it to light all candles in both carriers. He handed Hannah one of the candle holders. I think we should leave this place, Meredith, said Hannah. Don't you agree? Meredith didn't reply, instead looking at the door to the hallway with uncertainty. Hannah stood up and held a hand out for Meredith. Eventually, Meredith grabbed Hannah's hand and jumped out of the chair before Nigel led both of them out of the room. After a slow and methodical journey back the way they came, the trio eventually reached the kitchen. Nigel led Hannah and Meredith towards where the door in the kitchen leading them to freedom should have been. However, the door that Hannah left open was now gone, with nothing but a blank wall with chipped paint in its place. Nigel was stunned by the sight, prompting him to stop moving with a gasp and lean backwards. Hannah shared his look, while Meredith had the same mix of sadness and fear on her face that she always did. Nigel felt the wall up and down with his hand as he struggled to process what he was seeing. Where is it? said Nigel. The door was right here! You left it open behind you, didn't you, Hannah? Yeah, of course I did, said Hannah. Did we come the right way? Yes! The windows are gone too! Sure enough, Nigel was correct. The windows had disappeared, with an ageing blank wall also being in their place. Maybe we can unlock the main door from the inside, said Hannah. Agreeing with his partner, Nigel carefully walked around Hannah and Meredith so he could lead them back to the hall. Hannah continued to lead Meredith, gripping the child's hand a little more firmly to subtly make it clear she was ten times as scared as the child was. The entry hall, like the middle hall and the rest of the building, was also a complete mess. The front desk was damaged with a messy pile of papers, room keys, and what looked to be decades old dried up blood stains on it. Nigel noticed the stains as the trio entered the room, immediately taking his light away and giving a disgusted look as he hoped the other two didn't have time to see it. He led them to the middle of the room, illuminating where there should have been a door leading out front and another leading to under the arch outside. As with the kitchen, there was nothing more than yet another dirty, decrepit old wall sealing the three of them inside. No, there was a door here, said Nigel in frustration. And there, there were windows there! The part of the wall where there were once windows was illuminated by the candlelight. Sure enough, the windows were gone. Hannah, beginning to become distressed, looked around aimlessly. She looked at the square shelving unit for mail on the wall behind the desk which caused another green filtered vision to start. Each shelf was now full of mail for the guests. The loud, distorted screams of a demonic voice and a woman ran through Hannah's ears as if a high-powered jet engine was going off right next to them. It caused the mail to fly out of the shelves, followed by someone being thrown against the desk so hard that their heads cracked open and blood splattered on the front desk, creating the bloodstains that Nigel spotted moments ago.
The vision finally ended, with Hannah's candlelight now illuminating the dried up bloodstains. She stared at them before cringing her eyes shut. She took her other hand away from Meredith and put it to her head, prompting the equally distressed girl to clutch her teddy bear with both arms. Nigel was still panicking over the lack of a way out. He turned to Hannah and Meredith, realising that neither two of them were level-headed either. Hannah began rubbing her head as she slowly crouched down and pressed her back against the desk. She then slid down onto the ground completely. Meredith stood there alone, cold and afraid. Nigel began to compose himself, feeling some responsibility to take calm control over the situation. He walked over to the woman and the girl in his self-appointed care and crouched down to their level. <sighs> I just don't understand it, he said. Nigel looked at Meredith, who batted an eye at him for half a second before looking down again. Nigel looked over at Hannah with a concerned look. He put a hand on her knee, which startled her, prompting him to retract his hand very quickly and ask her what was the matter. I don't know, said Hannah. Something about this place. We have to try and use the door on the other side. Or one of the upstairs windows. Anything but being in here. All right, said Nigel before helping Hannah get back up. Are you going to be okay to keep moving? Yeah, I'll be fine. Nigel held out his hand to Meredith and told her to take it. She complied, grabbed her candle holder off of the ground and the three of them left the room to try and find another way out. Much like Nigel feared, the large window in the middle of the upstairs hall was gone, leaving nothing but a blank wall in its place. Slightly angered by this, he composed himself before leading his two friends to the other side of the hall and down the stairs to the other side of the building. The dining room was, like every other room, a total mess, with broken and knocked over tables and chairs, a giant smashed mirror hanging above the filthy fireplace mantel, torn and moth-eaten curtains covering nothing but the wall, and an open doorway leading into the sitting room. While Nigel and Meredith carefully navigated towards the sitting room, Hannah took a curious look around, holding her candle up to the broken mirror. Another green-filtered nightmare of a vision appeared to her as her eyes widened, sensing something coming from within the cracks of the mirror. What was now a beautiful but green-filtered dining area with windows behind the curtains full of guests in the form of blank humanoid shapes eating, reading and drinking at the tables became clear to Hannah. The sound of a horse neighing, accompanied by the windows suddenly exploding into a million pieces as the curtains waved about in the violent wind caused all the blank shapes to stop covering their heads and cowering in shock. The mirror was then violently kicked with two large hind horse legs, causing it to shatter into a million pieces like the windows. Hannah snapped back to reality, making a face with her eyebrows and dropping her jaw as she became unsure of what to make of the things she kept seeing. All she could say definitively was that the building was full of darkness, evil, and sadness that she could see and feel making contact with her very soul, and she knew it scared her more than anything she had seen in a cinema or the most criminally populated areas of London. She quickly caught up with Nigel and Meredith after fully composing herself, following them through the doorway into the sitting room. The room in question had six broken armchairs, three broken couches, a once beautiful rug now torn up and filthy, a few old and worn out desks with broken drawers, a chandelier that fell from the ceiling and smashed into pieces, and a small broken stove against the wall. Thinking little of the room, Nigel simply led the girls into the main hall. As she walked through, however, Hannah received yet another vision of the inn's past. This time, a very quick one of the chandelier smashing, with horse neigh and the violent screams of various men, women, children, and something demonic blaring in her ears. Gaining better control of the visions she was being forced to see, Hannah snapped herself back into awareness, quickly brushing it off as she kept following Nigel and Meredith. The main hall was something of a communal area, now derelict and abandoned like everything else within the building. There were two waiting room type wooden benches with leather seating and pillows against the backrests, although they were torn and dirty with foam spilling out of them. A tall tree with a few other plants in pots were long since dead and rotting, having been completely drained of sunlight and water. Nigel entered the room and, as partly expected, 
His candle illuminated the wall where the door should have been to reveal yet another dead end and no sign of any windows. In defeat, he released his grip on Meredith's hand, leaving her in Hannah's protection as he approached the wall, looking at it up and down. He sighed before pressing his head against the wall and put a hand against it. I'm cold and tired, said Meredith. So am I, Nigel moaned. He turned to face Meredith and Hannah. I think it's best if we... make ourselves comfortable. Hannah sighed and rolled her eyes in defeat. She looked down at Meredith and asked the child if she knew where they could sleep. Meredith nodded her head and took hold of Hannah's hand, leading her and Nigel back through the dining room. Once upstairs, Meredith led Nigel and Hannah into the fourth guest room. It wasn't the worst looking, with a bed that had a reasonably held together mattress that had a sheet and an old but not necessarily filthy woolly blanket covering it. There were two pillows on the bed, one slightly dirtier than the other. The frame was old and wooden but not damaged. As with the rest of the building, there were no windows, just blank walls. The ceiling was relatively well intact and there was a single bedside table with a broken lamp on it. There was a chair with a thick blanket on it in the corner, an old desk of drawers, a dresser, and a tall mirror on the wall with a long crack down the middle that split off into smaller cracks. A single door led into a small bathroom. Meredith stood in the doorway still like a statue with Nigel and Hannah at her side just behind her. As she slowly led them inside, Nigel thought to himself about the fact that the room wasn't as horrible as he thought it would be. He was still shocked that the child had to live in such conditions. How long have you been here, Meredith? he asked. Instead of answering, Meredith went over and sat on the edge of the bed. Hannah sat next to her and offered to sleep next to her, which Meredith happily agreed to with a few nods of her head. I'll sleep on the chair, said Nigel. I'll be close by in case of anything. Nigel walked over to the chair and started dragging it towards the bed. While he did, Meredith climbed over the bed to the other side and settled underneath the blanket. Hannah removed her shoes and made herself comfortable next to Meredith. Nigel took off his coat, picked the orange blanket up from off the chair and hung his coat over the chair's backrest. He took a seat and wrapped himself up in the blanket, getting as comfortable as he could in the chair. Meredith remained wide awake, while Hannah, who lay on her side facing the back of Meredith's head, stared blankly, still trapped in fear. I'm scared, whispered Meredith. So are we, sweetheart, said Hannah, but we'll find a way out. Nigel and I are good at that in spite of our appearances. Indeed, said Nigel. We'll figure all this out, my dear, and we'll leave this horrible place. Although the trio were trapped inside, the windows, including the broken ones, remained visible on the outside. Although any unfortunate passerby looking in would only see complete darkness, as if the windows were providing a peek into a black void, or another dimension entirely. Nigel struggled to sleep for quite some time due to the discomfort of sleeping upright in a chair before eventually drifting off mainly out of frustration at being awake for so long. Within his mind, violent green filtered flashes of the woods, a demonic face and the decrepit interior of the inn, accompanied by blood-curdling demonic screams and ear-raping white noise, began to haunt Nigel's mind. Even though it felt as brief as watching a professional track runner go past in a marathon, Nigel jumped wide awake at lightning speed five minutes later as all feeling of tiredness instantly left his body. The first thing he noticed in the midst of heavy panting was the once broken lamp that was now fully fixed and switched on. He looked over at the illuminated bed. Hannah and Meredith were gone, with only Meredith's cloak remaining. Standing up and throwing the blanket off, Nigel looked around in a state of anxiety and stress. He called out Hannah's name, but there was no response. He ran over to the bathroom door and swung it wide open. He flicked the light switch and it worked. The restroom had a bath with a shower head attached to the wall above it, a sink, and a brass tray on wheels with various cleaning products on it. There was a mirror on the wall above the sink, with a cup in a metal holder on the wall with two brand new toothbrushes and a tube of toothpaste in it. A railing on the wall had a few towels hanging over it, none of which were in the slightest bit torn up or dirty. There was no one. Confused and scared, Nigel stormed over to the chair, grabbed his overcoat and put it on. He looked at the wall and only then noticed the windows had returned. It was still dark outside, but in spite of his stress at having potentially lost his partner and the child, 
A sensation of relief overcame him. He headed over to one of the windows and took a look outside. From where he was standing, he could see a strange-looking man with a hunchback guiding some goats around the back of the building towards the pen by the courtyard. Bemused and shocked, he turned and ran towards the door leading to the upstairs hallway. Upon entering the hall, Nigel found it was completely clean and good as new, as though it was a completely different location. He looked around desperately, eventually hearing the door to the morning room open next to him, allowing classical music playing from inside the room to become audible to him. Out walked a woman still facing the door as she closed it. She slowly turned to Nigel in a way that suggested she already knew he'd be standing there. He looked at her in utter amusement. She was a youthful looking Japanese woman of 41 with a shawl wrapped around her shoulders. From her irradiated an unusually calm energy to the point she seemed barely human to Nigel. Her eyes were bright green and her lips were strawberry red to such a degree that Nigel imagined yellow seeds embedded into them. Good evening, sir, said the woman. I am Yui Nakamura. Will you be joining us in the dining area for the evening meal? Nigel had no answer only an open mouth with a weak attempt at saying something through his shock and lack of breath. I understand, said Yui. Do not feel bad if you need more rest. I'm sure we will have a chance to speak and become better acquainted soon. Good evening. Yui bowed her head and attempted to walk past Nigel towards the stairs, but she was instead treated to him aggressively grabbing her by the arm. Although she stopped and was startled by the action, she remained calm and compliant. Who are you? said Nigel in a demanding tone. Where are Hannah and Meredith? You know, the woman and the girl. You must know the girl, right? She's the little girl that lives here! You are harming me, sir, said Yui very passively. Please let go. Nigel only then realised what he was doing to Yui. He closed his mouth and looked down at his hand, firmly grasping the smaller and weaker woman's arm. He struggled for a moment before releasing his grip. Yui, relieved, smiled again. Perhaps you need something to drink? she said. Do come downstairs and meet my family. The other guests will be delighted by your presence as well, I'm sure. Watashi wa sushi shimasu, Najiru. As Yui gave another bow and an uncomfortably polite smile, Nigel felt uneasy looking at her. She finally faced forwards and calmly made her way towards the stairs, disappearing out of view. Nigel, still in shock, continued to look around the hall, realising moments later that he could still hear music coming from the morning room. He walked over to the door and waited for a moment before very slowly cracking it open and peeking his head inside. As with the miraculously cleaned and fixed upstairs hallway, the room was now completely done up and good as new, as were all the things within it that were previously broken. A new addition was an old timely record player with a very thick needle playing classical music. Nigel knew he should have found comfort in this, but as he opened the door and walked into the room, he couldn't help but feel more disturbed. The fire in the fireplace was dying as though it had been lit for some time. Not knowing how to feel, Nigel stepped away from the doorway without closing the door behind him, making a beeline for the stairs that led to the dining room. As soon as Nigel reached the bottom of the stairs, he found the dining room was not only completely fixed up, bright, and warmed up with a roaring fire, but it was populated by a colourful cast of guests. Yui's 48-year-old balding husband, a gentle, compassionate, and charming man never without an unintentionally creepy grin, the Nakamura daughter, a 16-year-old mute who bowed, nodded, and shook her head in response to everything, Ivan Brielt, an almost comically overweight 51-year-old man with a blonde toupee and thick fingers dressed in a grey three-piece suit with a green-tinted white shirt underneath, a 42-year-old England-loving American hitchhiker with short, dirty blonde hair dressed in a thin white t-shirt with knee-length shorts, which Nigel immediately thought was inappropriate clothing considering the weather and location, and Anne Raynott, a 38-year-old overweight, red-faced, and highly pompous Yorkshire native straight out of the early 1930s farm culture. Nigel took a minute to absorb everything, still unable to believe what he was seeing. The hitchhiker, the gentleman, and the Japanese tourists enjoying a meal composed of sausages, swede, Yorkshire puddings, stuffing, sprouts, mash, and asparagus like they were perfectly normal people, not in an innkeeper's that was completely abandoned and exitless mere moments ago. The windows had also returned to the dining room, giving a glimpse outside in the darkness. The only one who acknowledged Nigel's presence even remotely was Ivan who batted an eye for a split second before immediately returning to his newspaper. Shortly afterwards, 
Ben Raynott, Anne's male counterpart and husband, aged 45, walked in with a big smile on his face as he took a seat next to his wife. They shared a cheeky Yorkshire giggle before Ben rather greedily tucked into his food like his piggish wife. While they ate, Anne and Ben looked up at Nigel, giving him a chuckle and a friendly wave with big, plastered smiles on their faces. Nigel looked at the Nakamuras. Yui gave him a gentle nod. Her daughter and husband, Yoko and Toshiro, turned to Nigel, smiling at him and bowing with Yui. Konbanwa, my friend, said Yui's husband. I am Toshiro. My wife tells me you are the latest guest at the Gurin Hoso Inn, Anatomo Sanka Shimasenka? Not even a second after being politely greeted by the overly well-mannered man, Nigel darted his head in the direction of Anne as she burst out with an especially obnoxious laugh after Ben whispered something into her ear. This caused some of the food in her mouth to spill out like she was a child learning to eat solid food for the first time. She just managed to catch it in her hand, prompting her to laugh even more, which prompted Ben to start laughing in an especially grotesque manner. In the midst of their louder-than-a-plain laughter, Ivan coughed an equally obnoxious, loud, gruff, and posh-sounding cough into his thick-fingered hand, wiping his mouth and knuckles with his breast-pocket handkerchief immediately afterwards. Irritated by the laughing, he got up from his seat, folding his newspaper and holding it under his arms as he left the room for the sitting room. Ooh, somebody's upset, eh, Ben? spluttered Anne. Anne and Ben continued to laugh obnoxiously. Nigel noticed that there was a fourth place at the Nakamura table with an untouched plate of food and an untouched cup of hot tea. He very slowly approached the table and cautiously took a seat with the Nakamuras. I am Nakamura, Toshiro, said Toshiro. This is my wife, Yui, and this is our daughter, Yoko. We name her after Yoko Tsukasa of Yojimbo, the movie. You have seen it? Yoko slowly nodded at Nigel before taking a sip of her tea. Nigel took the fourth cup of tea into his hands. He looked over at the hitchhiker, who was intently focused on her book. It was a book about the Manchester Moors murders that were committed by Myra Hindley and Ian Brady, something that especially unnerved Nigel due to the countryside environment he was trapped in. To take his mind off of it, he looked back at the Nakamuras, who all smiled back at him before closing their eyes and nodding gently. Although they had creepy undertones, Nigel gently sipped the tea and looked pleasantly surprised but his anxiety didn't wane. It's very... said Nigel as he thought about the pleasant taste. It's good, 